Welcome back to Muslim Minds. We're gonna be reacting to every heresy explained in nine minutes by our favorite I guess. YouTuber. Yeah, he commented on our channel. I'll he post did, a yeah, screenshot. Yeah, YouTuber, yeah. I mean, how could he not? We made so many videos yeah. about his content. And I guess Christianity has a lot of heresies. Mm, that's true. <laughs> when you hear the word heresy, you might think of witch burnings or the church torturing Galileo for doing science, which didn't even happen, by the way. But all heresy really means is a belief that's incompatible with something. So a Christian heresy is a belief that's incompatible with Christianity. The first heresy is liberalism. Now, to be clear, this isn't political liberalism. This has nothing to do with Christians who like the Democrats Before or whatever. On, like, it's pretty clear that he's probably going to talk more about traditional strands of Christianity. Because liberalism, I mean, there are some Christian denominations that adopt everything, man. You know, including the ideas of like uh, liberalism. Again, not, I know he's referring not to like kind of like in a democratic kind of way. More kind of like in a free spirit sense. Um, some sex it's kind of like a reformed Judaism where there are some Jews that don't even believe in God. So that, it's just like the name Christianity, but it doesn't mean anything. Right. Like it's just kind They're of not holding to dissolve. Anything. Yeah. It's more just like a like a fan club. Not even a, just a club. It just means not taking the beliefs of Christianity seriously, sometimes not believing the Bible is the word of God. Liberalism destroys the foundations of Christianity, like the virgin birth, the resurrection of Christ, the divinity of Christ, and in some cases, the idea of a supernatural God altogether. People try to have Christianity without these foundations, but then it just falls apart. It starts with people saying that Christianity is more about following Jesus than what we believe about Jesus, and that turns into saying it doesn't matter what you believe about Jesus as long as you're following him by being vaguely loving or nice. And that turns into saying we don't even know if the claims of Christianity are true, but it's okay as long as it inspires us to do justice. And in the end, people say God is just an idea that inspires us to do justice rather than something that- At that point though, we don't know if Jesus rose from the dead, but he insp still inspires us to be good. With all due respect, um, I would say that that is one that's actually kind of more believable out of the other three options because the accounts we have of Jesus' life, death, resurrection come primarily from the Gospels and a couple of sources outside of the New Testament. But aside from that, there's no you know historical evidence of Jesus' resurrection aside from just um, you know essentially what is hearsay. Uh, with again regarding those beliefs about Jesus, the what makes that problematic was that those were not even the only beliefs about Jesus' life or who he was. For example, we mentioned in our past videos about the Ebionites. They have far different, you could say even like radical views about Jesus, that he is not God, not divine at all, which to a Christian is complete blasphemy, like modern day Christian, right? So Unless you're a liberal. So, and then even the ideas of docetism, that Jesus was like a phantom, not even like a real person. Yeah. Like, there's just so many different bizarre beliefs, you know, apocryphal gospels that have been just kind of ruled out, weeded out from what we have today. And, um, you know, obviously we think it's also influenced from history and the region in which Christianity thrived. I think all of that plays a factor actually exists. Liberalism says Christianity can mean whatever you want it to mean, but the Bible says that if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is meaningless. If Christianity can mean anything, then it really means nothing. So when you see a church flying a pride flag or preaching only about politics and not about theology, that's a sign that the church doesn't really believe anything anymore, so it just takes the mold of whatever the current culture believes. So it does matter what we believe about Jesus. True or false? Jesus is the greatest being God ever created. Uh, true, right? No, that's Arianism, not the German kind. Arianism comes from an early church guy named Arius who said that God created Jesus. So Jesus is like God, but he's not actually God. Since God created Jesus, there was a time when Jesus didn't exist, and that means he's not God, because God is eternal. But then Arius got slapped by Santa Claus for saying that. <laughs> the truth is Jesus was never created because Jesus slapped by Santa Claus. Yeah, what they, what they kind of say oh. to explain the way Jesus coming into creation, they say that, you know, the God, the Son, always existed but became incarnate in the human flesh that is Jesus. Well, that does not make sense. I think <laughs> Arius was onto something. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, why did Santa Claus? Why, why did people like Arius exist? You know, in the councils, people say there was like complete. I always knew Santa was not real. Right? You know, people always say that there's a unanimous, or a unanimous agreement amongst like the early church fathers, which wasn't the case. A lot of people also just voted to what was, you know, supported at the time by political, the, by politics. political power. Um, so you have to ask I like the Arius better than Saint Nick. <laughs> Look at him. So majestic. No, but just, you know, if you think about it, like, you know, 
Why were the Ebionites? Why did they exist? You know, Jesus again. Try to, try to look at it from our perspective, right? You know, people will say that the you know New Testament says that Jesus was God, but there are some other passages that may say it otherwise. Jesus has always existed because Jesus is God. The whole point of Christianity is worshiping Jesus Christ, and you're only supposed to worship God, so that means Jesus is God. There's a lot of religions that think Jesus was important in some way. What makes Christianity different is saying Jesus is literally the one true God. So Arianism turns Christianity into not Christianity. By the way, the Jehovah's Witnesses are an example of modern-day Arians. So Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are all the one true God. How does that work? Are they like... Just to talk about this, like, you know, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus the Son are not each other, but they're all the same being, right? It's a contradiction because if you are fully something, if, the, if Jesus the Son is fully God, but he's not the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is also fully God, then that means they're both like the same, like Jesus and the Spirit would be one and the same. Because if they're both fully something, then you embody all of what that thing is, including the Holy Spirit. That's in the tenet of the Trinity itself. And, um, you know, going on the point of the Trinity, you also have, one knows the hour, not the Son, nor the Spirit, but only the Father in Heaven. So he makes a distinction between himself and the Spirit, not knowing the hour with the Father, that the Father is the only one who knows. If God is eternal, all-knowing, then that means Jesus cannot be God. Neither can the Holy Spirit. This is from Jesus' own admonition. Like, how can you argue with that? No, Let's that... see what our Zuber says. Like three forms of God? No, that's another heresy called modalism. They can't just be three forms of the same person because we see them interacting with each other. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. But they're all the one true God. So it's not three forms of God, it's one God in three persons. Got it, so the three persons are three like three persons parts. like that somehow makes it not three separate beings. Like, oh, it's just three, like, you know, they say persons, but like, it's like, how can three persons be one person? <laughs> I don't, what does persons mean then? Exactly, just kind of like playing with words. Like persons are completely separate. Yeah, it's like three, but they're one. It's just, you can say it, but it doesn't mean it makes sense, you know? Parts of God? No, that's a heresy called partialism, which says the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each only one third God. It's heresy because in reality they're all a hundred percent God. But they're they not all each other, so they're like lacking in some elements of what God is. If God is the Spirit, is the Father, is the Son, but they're not each other, wouldn't that mean they're all parts of God? That you know, it's a lot of Christians don't understand the Trinity. That's partialism, so shut up. How dare you? Hey man, don't come after me. We all have everything that makes God God, and God's nature cannot be divided or broken into parts. Okay, now I got it. Three beings that are all 100% God. Guess what? What? That's heresy! If you're saying there's three beings that are all God, then you're saying there's three gods. Who's the Bible Jesus is very clear that God is one being. Beings. So it's heresy to say that there's three beings. God is one being in three persons. The Mormons are actually an example of people who commit the tritheist heresy. So it's very important to be right about the Trinity, because if we're not, we're basically inventing a different God. Also, don't use analogies when you're talking about the Trinity. Yeah, this because is every thing wanna, you know, Whenever we kind of discuss the topic with the Christians in the comments, they oftentimes try to bring up analogies or comparisons to get us to understand. 99.9% of the time, it's no, an analogy. No, 100% of the time, it's an analogy, and it's always heresy. Because there's, and this is the point that we're making, there is no analogy, no comparison in nature, or the observable universe for that matter, where you can have something that represents the Trinity. It doesn't work. Like the three-leaf clover, for example. Those are three different leaves that make up the same leaf, but they're each parts that make up. You can't, one cannot exist without the other. So if you remove the sun, it's like an independent leaf head yeah. on its own. If I pick up that clover and rip one part off, exactly, where does it go? Or like, you know, if you look at like this, uh, look right here, the light, I guess, the earth and the sun. Like those are still three entities. In each one of these examples, they're entities, but they're not all one the same thing at the same time. Does that make sense? Analogy people make ends up accidentally committing one heresy or another. The Trinity is not like anything in our world, so we can't make analogies between the two. Wait, but I have a good analogy. No, you don't. Shut up. It's also really important oh, to be right about Jesus, because we worship Jesus. 
Some people think when Jesus was a baby, he could have spoken fluent Swahili or done quantum physics because, you know, he's God. But that's a heresy called Apollinarianism, which says Jesus had a divine mind, but not a human mind. Yes, Jesus is God, which means he has a divine mind, but he's also truly human, which means he has this a human... another explanation developed to kind of explain away the disparity of Jesus at many times seem, seeming to be just a human being and saying that I don't do the will of my own, I do the will of the Father, denying knowing the hour, all these kind of, you know, being able to die, be crucified, you know, God can is not able, that doesn't apply to him, right? So they explain this by saying, oh, but he's also fully human. But my counter to that is if you are God, all powerful, all powerful, limitless, all knowledgeable, you know, ever living, then you, 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 you if, if you're a human who happens to also be God, that would only give you a boost. It wouldn't nerf you in some kind of way. And any kind of negativity, any kind of weakness or limitation that, that is demonstrated by Jesus' nature is a limitation we're applying to him being God because Jesus is both God and man at the same time, right? So any deficiency he has, for some reason, is not overridden by his God power, which it should, because he's God, all powerful. So it's a con it's another contradiction from our perspective, and I think objectively. Human mind. The Bible says Jesus needed to learn stuff just like the rest of us. If you're saying Jesus didn't have the limitations of a human mind, then you're saying Jesus wasn't truly human. So let's not be Apollinarian. Bro, why does this matter? Well, Jesus needs to become everything we are to redeem everything we are. So Jesus needs to have a human mind so he can redeem our human minds. That's just like so we got to understand the two natures of Jesus. He's saying he he's, has to, but there's no explanation why. He's just saying because yeah. he has to because it fits a theology. Well, we have Muslim minds here. Yeah. God, and he's also human. So how does this work? If Mary is the mother of Jesus, does that mean she's also the mother of God? Yeah. Nah, she's not the mother I mean, of God. Jesus. She's just the mother of human Jesus. That's what Catholics but no, see. that's it. Catholics completely disagree with this. They call her the mother of God, divine queen of heaven. It doesn't even make sense, though, because she was born from a human. So how is she a mother of God? That's what I'm saying. Like, it's just they're, they're picking God. and choosing when Jesus is, it applies to be God or not. When he was born, okay, she's not. I mean, Jesus is supposed to be God. If she's giving birth All to Jesus. All his explanations are good, but a lot of, like, baseline stuff. He's just kind of like it's just a fact. Then yeah. there's no questioning behind that part. No, and I know what he what he's doing here. He's yeah. he's actually providing scholarly interpretations from early you know church fathers. So it's not his fault. But yeah. the, my problem is those church fathers sat down with councils and developed the theology over the span of a hundred hundreds of years because of this confusing mess. That's why there's all these semantics and mental gymnastics and like, oh, he was human and God and not at this time, but he was here, and that's why he didn't know the hour. Like there's a clever explanation for everything. I mean, anyone can do, you're just sitting down and you're explaining away the problems. Like no matter what you pose as a legitimate concern, you know, there's no analogy comparable to the, to the Trinity. It's contradictory. How can three equal one, but they're all distinct. They're not even all each other, but they're all fully the same being. And that means they would share the same characteristics if they're all 100% the same being, right? But the, these kind of explanations are invented in such a way to explain away these kind of doubts from people's hearts. But we're just saying from a non-Christian perspective, like we're not going to immediately just hear those, these reasons and be like, yeah, no, it makes sense because we're being told it makes sense because it makes sense. But that still doesn't satisfy like the itch or kind of like the, the, contradictory, the contradiction. We're obviously, saying. we already understand Islam and just makes more sense. Or just based off the understanding of God, even according to Christianity, that he's all knowing, limitless, all powerful. If Jesus doesn't know something, if he had to learn to be wise. You can't just simply explain that off by saying, oh, but he was also a human. He was God. God is the most, he is the most powerful. He is the all-knowing. And if he is God at the same time as being human, they're not separable. He is, I mean, if Jesus is God, then he's God. Like, is there a switch? <laughs> you know? A heresy called Nestorianism. Nestorians think the divine nature is God the Son, and the human nature is Jesus, and Christ refers to both of them. So you can say Mary's the mother of Jesus, or even the mother of Christ, but not the mother of God. They also think you can say Jesus died on the cross, or Christ died on the cross, but not God died on the cross, so because the divine sense. nature can't die. The problem you know, with... It's funny, because I always hear Christians a lot of the time saying, like, you know, it's so amazing how God came down became a human and died for our sins. But then you have this explanation, oh, God didn't die on the cross, Jesus did. But Jesus is supposed to be God. Like, we're just, like, in my opinion, in, in a simple term, my sound harsh, it just seems like we're playing games. You know what I mean? 
Jesus is God, I'll be dead, dad. Like, because he's he's only trying to find an answer, another problem reveals himself. So then another another heresy has to be made. Like, in the context of history, they kept trying to solve it, and then another problem happens. What was the point? And then they kept trying to solve it again. What was the point of Jesus or God coming down to become a human, but to not actually die as God, just die from a human perspective? Like, what's the entire point there? Like, Jesus just, just, like, functioning as a messenger. To show us that he did it. But he didn't we even do to, it. We have to love each other because of it. All right. I, mean, I can love myself or someone else without someone dying. Historianism is it separates the humanity and divinity of Christ. It treats human Jesus and divine Jesus like they're two different people. In reality, the two natures are united in the one person of Christ. So we can use the words Christ, Jesus, and God interchangeably when talking about the person of Christ. Oh, we can so say Jesus of Nazareth. Maybe he's talking about the historians are the ones who say God didn't die on the cross. I mean, Watch that again, actually. Christ. The problem with Nathos, but not God died on the cross because the divine nature can't die. The problem with Nestorianism is it separates the humanity and divinity of Christ. It treats human Jesus and divine Jesus like they're two different people. In reality, the two natures are united in the one person of Christ. So we can use the words Christ, Jesus, and God interchangeably when talking about the person of Christ. We can say Jesus of Nazareth created the Milky Way galaxy. We can also say the God of the universe became a baby and died for your sins. It's an important question. Do we worship a God who died for your sins? Is a heresy to him. Yeah. Where so, they said that God didn't die. But he's yeah. saying you can separate yeah. Jesus, Christ, and God. Mm-hmm. Jesus is not God. Christ connects Jesus and God. Yeah. So I mean that kind of makes more sense to me than believing that uh Jesus It's kind of the like God this, of the universe became a baby and died for his sins. This is how I look at it, like God, can he create a rock he can't lift? No. Can God no. become a baby? Like there are some things that God, doesn't even make sense. You're not a baby then. Like the thing, exactly. There, there's some things that God cannot do, but that doesn't mean he is like limited in a sense that makes him weak. God you know? cannot be birthed. That's like it's like if I like if I can't turn into a worm, like that doesn't necessarily mean I'm limited in that kind of sense that you're thinking. Like in a I mean, sense nowadays you're not limited. You can be a worm. <laughs> like actually, think about this for a moment. Like I'll ask you like some really harsh questions. Can God just stop existing? Can God create another God more powerful than him and kill himself? Can God become a roll of toilet paper? Like, ask, I'm, I'm just being straight up honest with you. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Like, where do we draw the line and what God can do? Just potentially. Can God become evil? Can God become wicked? Can God, like, you know, where does it stop? Can God become a Snickers bar? It's like, you have to, <laughs> you, you have to ask yourself these questions. Again, I'm not trying to be polarizing. Maybe I am a little bit, but like, Understand the frustration here. You know, we have this respect of God and his view and who he is and he's all powerful. And then to say he came as a human and died is completely antithetical to who God is in his, in his majesty and his, his, he's ever living. He doesn't die. He's all powerful, full knowledge of everything. Jesus admits to not knowing the hour, you know, people will say, Oh, what about the I am statements? I mean, the thing is about the gospels is you can't even trust their historical reliability. I'm not just saying that as an excuse to, talk about those passages where Jesus is sound made to sound divine. I totally agree that the Bible, the New Testament, Jesus looks like a divine figure. But in what sense? You know, we have early Christian denominations and groups thinking that Jesus was a semi-God. He was a partner to God. Maybe he was a phantom. Maybe he wasn't God at all. Like the Ebionites are just their interpretation. The point is, is there's contradictions. That's the main problem. And to run away from that or to deny that is kind of, I mean, you have to explain these away through interpretations that come from outside of the scripture primarily to explain it, you know, that don't really deal with the clear and plain obvious text. Jesus says he doesn't know the hour. Jesus says he's doing the will of his father. Jesus says the father is greater than himself. So if there are verses that say the opposite of that, that doesn't mean that's fully now immediately confirming that he is God. It just merely means that there's a contradiction. Like the four gospels don't even agree on what day Jesus was crucified. Is that not the most significant day in all of history to Christians? But they can't agree if it was on the Passover or after the Passover. Like even that is debated on. For us, biblical Christianity says yes, but Nestorianism as well as Islam would say no.
Now, some people make the opposite mistake of mixing Jesus' two natures into one combined nature, making Jesus seem more like one of those Greek demigods that's part God and part human. But that's heresy. Jesus needs to be truly human and truly God to bridge the gap between humans and God. Now, there is a type... Needs to, needs to. But why do we need something like that? Like, we that's what just... I meant. Like, just making some conclusion. But some stuff he's explaining, but this... Why isn't what he's saying a heresy? You know, like yeah, like what? He's okay. So he's saying that reality is like this because it has to be. But every other faith tradition in the world doesn't really believe that. Again, I know that many or almost all of the faith traditions in the world, what they believe, don't doesn't matter. But just think about it from this perspective. You know, for Muslims, for example, we believe that the bridge to God are prophets and messengers, and that you follow yeah. the laws. And, and that's, a, that's literally what happened yeah, before I Jesus. Mean, but Moses, in our Abraham. Opinion, yeah. What he's saying must be, we think, is a heresy, which is why Islam was revealed in the first place. For most so, of human history, people were not bridged to God through Jesus. Jesus is 2,000 years old. But, but way prior to that... Yeah, and they believe the Jesus was birthed as a God, right? Yeah. But he always existed, but then and no one else in believed in the yes. Trinity before them. So what... Yeah, so there was no Trinity, there was no bridge to God. There was bridge in other ways, like the, the Christians will say only the past sacrifice. prophets believe but, only one God. No, but they, even they even reinterpret the Old Testament. They say the only way to God was through sacrifice back in the day because they needed to justify how Jesus' sacrifice was necessary. But Christ, or a Jewish authority will tell you, no, that sacrifice was not the only way for atonement. You could repent. God forgave an entire people in the Old Testament just on the basis of repentance. No sacrifice. God looks for teshuva, toba, or repentance. Right? One of the mechanisms of that is sacrifice. People say, oh, God says he doesn't forgive without the blood being shed. I don't know the exact verse verbatim, but it's in Hebrews. But that's in the New Testament. Obviously, that's the theology. In the Old Testament, that's not the case. There are burnt offerings. What about burnt offerings? You're not killing anything. There's no shedding of blood. But you can still be forgiven. They took the Old Testament and read and it, you know, took the theology, extracted it, and injected Christianity with it to make it you know, seem related to that history. But the problem, even with the Old Testament, is you cannot verify that Moses wrote the five books of, of the Pentateuch. You can't, because you have, there's clear, uh, historians say there's a redactor that stitched together several writings over a span of a very long time, none which can be traced back to Moses. The earliest writings we have of the, of the Old Testament are the Dead Sea Scrolls, which Orthodox Jews say contain many errors and they reject it as something to be credible. There's some credibility in there, but they rejected kind of how we view the, the New Testament, that there are many statements Jesus says in the New Testament that are totally true about God and, you know, whatever good works that Jesus recommends that his followers do, you know, uh, being merciful and charitable and, you know, uh, worship for God, all these kind of things, right? But it's the same kind of error here that we just see that there's not much reliability. Just like we, the earliest Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls are 1,100 years after Moses. That poses a problem. You can't even substantiate, substantiate it or trace it back to its origin type of monophysitism called neophysitism, which still uses the language of one nature, but also agrees with all this stuff, so that type is not technically heretical. Adoptionism is a heresy that says Jesus became God at some point, but wasn't always God. Here's why that doesn't work. Being God means being eternal. So if that means Jesus was ever God at any point, it means Jesus is also eternal, which means Jesus has always existed. That's what eternal means. And if Jesus has always existed, that means he's always God. So that means Jesus has always been God. So adoptionism fails. Are you a good person? No, not according to the Bible, at least. The Bible says we're all sinners from the moment of conception. But Pelagianism denies this fact. Pelagianism says we're all born as blank slates with free will to choose good or bad. Pelagianism says you can save yourself. You don't need Jesus to die for you. But that's heresy. We're all slaves to sin. We all deserve to go to hell. That's why Jesus needed to die for us. Gnosticism is another big explanation that he needed to die for us. Why? Why can't God understand that he made a sinful creation, that we try our best to strive, we seek repentance, and if we strive hard enough and attain his mercy through his mercy and grace, it's all through his guidance, right? Then we are admitted to paradise. But to say that we must rely on the sacrifice, God knew the sins of his creation. So, you know, the way I would phrase it to some of my Christian, you know, friends is God came down and killed himself as a result of what his own creation did and to allow himself to forgive god killed himself to allow himself to forgive what does that even jesus died he took the sacrifice god is jesus so god took on the sacrifice but 
it's just a whole redundant mess. Like, why does God have to come and punish himself? Oh, God says there must be a punishment. Why? Why does, if there has to be a punishment, why is he punishing himself? How is that even a punishment? Punishment that he didn't even do anything. He's God. Like, you see how this doesn't make sense? It sounds nice. Like, oh, Jesus came down. He took the sin of the world. He's taking the punishment. But the punishment also happens. Like, your son, he breaks your neighbor's window. And then you crucify yourself. I'm just being, again, I'm being polarizing. You know, instead of disciplining your son or teaching your son to repent and change his ways, which Jesus did granted, but to kind of make that all a weird mess by then punishing yourself doesn't make sense. It, there's no justice in that. It's just weird. It, it makes no sense. It doesn't establish justice. Someone innocent being punished, in this case, Jesus, who also happens to be God, doesn't really solve anything. Heresy. It's got a lot of complex lore that we don't need to go into, but basically it says this physical world is bad. So our goal is to escape this horrible place and go to the spiritual world, which is good. The first problem is it denies that a good God created our physical universe, but also Jesus took on a physical human nature. Jesus came to redeem the physical. A lot of us think this way even if we don't know it. A lot of people think the goal of Christianity is to escape this world and go to heaven, which is supposedly something completely different from Earth. But no, Jesus came to redeem the Earth, and when Jesus comes back, he's going to unite heaven and Earth and make a perfect version of this world that we're going to live in forever. So the physical isn't bad. The physical will be redeemed by Jesus. Subordinationism is a heresy that says Jesus eternally submits to the Father. Now, it's understandable why some might think this, because the Bible does speak of Jesus submitting his will to the Father's will. But that's only according to Jesus' human nature. This Jesus is what I'm saying, bro, and this argument really irritates me. Whenever there's something that clearly contradicts the theology, they use this argument. Oh, he's because he was a human in that moment. He turned on his human switch. Wait, I thought human divine was a heresy, is it not? Well, this is the this is the problem. It's a contradiction. They say you can't yeah. separate. Why is this not a heresy? The, look, they say you can't separate the two, but then when it's convenient, they separate the two. Jesus yeah, this is, is partialism. God. Is, it's it's this uh, is partialism more like modalism. The, the Gnosticism, more like because here's the thing: Jesus is God and human fully yeah. at the it's same time. It's also modalism time. because it's two different modes: a divine when, and a human. When Jesus is talking, you guys will say it's God talking. When he's crucified, you say it's God being crucified, right? So this doesn't make divine sense. nature does not submit to the Father. So that means there's two different things. Yeah, because they say it doesn't submit to the Father because he is God. But that doesn't even make sense. Does not submit to the Father? That's a separate thing. That's the re a part. The reason, yeah, but then the language itself it doesn't make sense. I know maybe you can yeah, no, something, I, I but it saying. doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying because it's like. It's not a part. Like for, yeah. for me, for example, even for me to say my hands. It's like is Jesus to me, as a divine nature does not submit to himself. Yeah. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> like that's like me saying my hand doesn't submit to myself. Even that would be incorrect because Jesus is not the equivalent of a hand when it comes to the Godhead. He is fully God. Fully. Meaning it's everything like God is. is not your hand. Everything God is, Jesus is supposedly. So him submitting him will, his will to himself, like it, it's irrational. And at the same time, he's a human. That submits to the Father, but that human is God at the same time. He's God incarnate. He's nothing else but God. You know? It, yeah. Human will submits to the Father because all humans are supposed to submit to God. But his divine will doesn't submit to the Father because his divine will is the same exact will as the Father's will. There's also some heresies that can be explained in one sentence, so I don't really need to spend time on them. Now, some people think Christians are being way too nitpicky with all this stuff, but the truth is everyone is religious and dogmatic about something. It's just a question of what. The more passionate you are about something, the more willing you are to argue about it. Christians love Jesus, so we want to be right about Jesus. And I think Jesus is someone worth arguing about. So, um, I like the video. The fact that the word Trinity isn't explained all the, the uh, heresies. It kind of ended up being us more kind of discussing the whole nature of Jesus and kind of not giving credence to the heresies, but like explaining why they came about. Because like we established, if it's not found in nature through any kind of analogy we can see, then you can see how human beings who try to rationalize things would find this to be such a troubling concept. You have contradictory Bible passages 
that make it seem like Jesus isn't divine, and the only way to explain that is by saying, oh, he was also a human at the same time. But yeah, Jesus like, is God. Why? All those things were heresies, but why What is what he is saying is not also a heresy? It doesn't make sense, because he's just stopping at his Histori- view. Historically. Because some people might have the other view of what they're calling heretical. Yeah. Like, uh, what's it called? Um, Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. They call them her- heretics but those people will call other groups heretics yeah and we as muslims and this is not to say we're defending yeah. more but like they're, they're just we're picking just and choosing. making an argument so <clears throat> like we're right. saying what we're essentially saying is why do they have the authority and i have a, i think there's a pretty good explanation for this it's the history of christianity and which it thrived because if you see the early christians why was there so much confusion why were there so many different books and beliefs Part of the reason is the amount of persecution they had. How can you preserve your faith? How can you effectively spread your faith when you're being butchered in the streets, fed to lions? This is what happened to Christians, right? But and under what? The Roman Empire. But then the Roman Empire becomes Christian. Do you think they just accepted the religion fully as it was? No. No. I believe that, and it, it seems very clear by the echoing of Jesus' story with other pagan figures, right? Like Dionysus, for example, there's many parallels in Jesus' story with many other pagan uh, like characters. Why is this the case? Some can say it was made to be more palpable for that kind of region in which it was in. You know, the idea of Trinity. Trinity has existed far before Christianity and Jesus, right? So it's kind of like a blending of the theology. The only way it could survive is by it being kind of corrupted, you know? Um, this is why you have, like, if you look at the development of Christianity in the earliest manuscripts, 125 years, P66, after Jesus, you have the Trinity, you know, Trinity kind of being established or, you know, really brought up in councils like 300 years after Jesus, you know, and further establishments of different articles of the faith well into the 4th and the 5th century, you know. Some people will say, no, all of those councils were just to, like, war off other heresies, but that's exactly what I'm saying heresies existed different opinions existed weeding them all out putting them all down in a way is and then preserving the one that just survived doesn't mean it must be the correct one you know that's just our take you know so you know much can be said we're we're not again trying to be disrespectful it's just our take we're obviously not christians but that's not the reason we're just sitting here denying everything we're just trying to share you our thoughts you know no analogies yeah. work. Concept of Trinity is confusing. It seems like some of the explanations are kind of cheap and easy, right? When it's a bit more complex than that. Like if Jesus is clearly sounding not like a God and denying many things that a God could not deny, like knowledge about something or the capabilities of something or submitting his will to someone, and then the explanation is, oh, well, he's a human. It just seems kind of convenient. Yeah. <clears throat> even, I was trying to take it from even like a non-Muslim view, but what he was saying is like the truth from rational the way he was explaining it why wouldn't that cannot also be be a heresy too it just doesn't make sense yeah. which was our point like why <clears throat> yeah he's he's uh mentioning the most affirmed christian position that has survived through history as if that is true but you know yeah the have, other we things have, we have at one point were like a very major thing but it just didn't last to the point where they're they're yeah. meant they're noteworthy you know yeah like areas <clears throat> Now again, look, we're not, we're, not, we're not sitting here saying, "Hey, guess what? All those heresies valid." No, we're not saying that. We're saying that there are so many of them. Some of them that challenge the core of the theology, who Jesus was. That's a pretty big deal, you know. There has to be a reason behind that. Like Ebionites, one of the earliest Christian sects, don't believe Jesus was divine at all. You know, you have to ask yourself these hard questions. And, um, you know, investigate for yourself, you know, like some things that we find also troubling. Majority of the New Testament comes from Paul or influences from Paul. Paul is someone who didn't meet Jesus, uh, Jesus directly during his life. He met him post-resurrection, you know, in a lot, you know, uh, kind of his own path, a light, a vision that he had. And then even had a disagreement with the apostles. But everything is from Paul's account. We don't know anything about the apostles' side. We don't know how they made up or anything. We just know that Paul was upset with the disciples, calls them so-called pillars. He mocks them. And then he even says, like, why do they preach a, a, a gospel, um, uh, a fault, like a different gospel? He's speaking about the Galatians, I believe. And Paul says um, something about why do they deny a crucified Jesus? Almost like he's like mentioning that there are sayings or teachings out there of a Jesus who is not crucified, which is, you know, there are positions out there. 
even from Christian uh, physicians that Jesus was not crucified or that Simon of Cyrene was made to uh, transfigure to look like Jesus on the cross. Not, we're not saying that's the case, but there are early Christian, uh, I think, I forget which group it is, but there are early Christian groups who believe that. But it's like, why is there so much confusion? Why is there so much debacle? The answer is not because Christianity just started as a false religion. No, not at all. It's because of their torture and persecution. How can you preserve something like that? Yeah. But yeah, if you guys enjoyed, like and subscribe. Anything we said or anything based on the video, comment down below. We'll try to get to them. And assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam.